100. This is the lecture video for chapter 18, Thermodynamics, and of course, I am your instructor, Professor Curtis. Let's get started. So thermodynamics is the study of how to use energy to do useful work. And the energy that we're really interested in mostly is taking heat or thermal energy and putting it to do useful work. This definition reflects the Greek words from which Lord Kelvin coined the name thermodynamics in 1854. We've seen Lord Kelvin before when we introduced the Kelvin temperature scale. And as we're going to see in this lecture, the Kelvin temperature scale is really useful when you're studying thermodynamics. So he coined this word from two Greek words. So if we look at the word thermodynamics, thermo comes from the Greek word for heat. Dynamics comes from the Greek word for power. So thermodynamics is literally heat power. And that's what thermodynamics is. We're learning how to use energy, and particularly heat energy, to power equipment to power processes to do useful work now thermodynamics i have to tell you is a world unto itself so before we go any farther with this let me just say this you know as an engineer when i was an undergraduate you know i took an entire course that lasted an entire semester on thermodynamics and that was just the tip of the iceberg Okay, so thermodynamics really is a world unto itself. And part of what makes it a world unto itself is not just uh, its unique concepts, but also the vocabulary needed to describe those unique concepts. So there's a whole lot of words that we could get into about what they mean what. Um, your textbook author gets into some of those. I think a lot of that is unnecessary. Again, I want to focus on the concepts of what we're looking at. So, you know, I'm going to try to keep things as simple as I can. <laughs> and, of course, you know, there's calculus involved with some of this stuff. And I can show you some of that as we get toward the end of the lecture. But, you know, the main concepts that we want to focus on with thermodynamics, I'm going to try to keep that as simple as I possibly can. So on that note, Let's take a look at the laws of thermodynamics. So there are four laws of thermodynamics. There's three official laws, and there's one unofficial law. Some people include it, some people don't. And I'm going to talk about all four of these. Now, your textbook author directly describes two of these laws, and then he makes indirect reference to the other two. He doesn't actually call them laws, but he indirectly refers to them as you go along in the chapter. And yeah, again, he's a physicist. I'm an engineer. So I'm going to give you what I really think is the real deal. And because thermodynamics is a world unto itself, there's different ways to look at everything. I'm going to share some of those different perspectives with you as we go through. But again, the focus I want to help you hone in on is keeping things as simple as possible. So to start off with, I'm going to share with you the four laws of thermodynamics in my own words, keeping everything as simple as possible. And then we're going to look at each one of these laws in turn. So here are the four laws of thermo according to Doc. The first law is not really no law number one. It's actually law number zero. And this is this law number zero because it's the unofficial law that's sometimes mentioned by some people and sometimes not mentioned by other people. So the zeroth law of thermodynamics says any systems in equilibrium with each other must have the same temperature. That's the unofficial law. Now let's get into the three official laws. First up, first law of thermodynamics says that the total amount of energy for any system is always conserved. We've seen this before, conservation of energy. We saw that first when we were studying mechanics. Well, it applies also to thermal systems. So the first law of thermodynamics says the total amount of energy for any system is always conserved. The second law of thermodynamics says heat spontaneously flows from hot to cold. Again, we've already seen this uh, in studying thermal systems. Heat spontaneously flows from hot to cold. This is the direction of heat transfer 
between an object of higher temperature and an object of lower temperature. So again, nothing really new here. And then the third law of thermodynamics says it is impossible to reach absolute zero temperature. Now, there are, of course, different ways to look at each of these laws, and we're going to look at those uh, as we go through each one of these laws individually. But if you just focus on the concepts that are listed here in the way that I've worded them, this should, this should get you like 90% of the way. Because there are different perspectives on the same thing, but it's still the same thing. So looking at these concepts here, if you just focus on these concepts, this should get you through for most of what you need. Now before we look at each of the laws individually, let's understand some of the conventions that thermodynamics has. Some of these conventions we've actually seen before, but we need to go through them to make sure we're all on the same page. Again, remember, thermodynamics is an entire world unto itself. So, of course, there's going to be conventions for how we operate within that world. You know, conventions are just agreed upon orders or relationships. So let's go over a few of them that we need to understand for our little journey into thermodynamics. First, we're going to define a system and the surroundings based on the boundaries that we use to define the system. Then we're going to observe what forms of energy are crossing over system boundaries and how much of each form is crossing a system boundary. And then we're going to quantify how much of each of those energy forms is available to do useful work. Once we know that, then we can solve whatever equations we need to solve to discover whatever missing variables we need to find out about. So these are the basic conventions that we're going to be using for our little journey here into thermo. So first let's talk about defining a system. We've seen this before when we talked about mechanics, but let's go over it again just to make sure we're all on the same page. Remember, a system is simply that volume of physical space or matter that we want to study. So you know, going back to the example that we saw earlier when we studied mechanics, we've got an eclipse here. So the moon-sun combination, we define that as our system. Okay, then that means the surroundings is going to be everything outside the system. So by defining the system, we've necessarily also defined the surroundings. Then, of course, the universe is the system plus the surroundings. So the system plus everything outside of it, that's going to be our universe. So because the universe is everything, and it's made up of the system and the surroundings, when we define the system, that is going to, by def default, define what the surroundings are. And again, the boundaries that we choose are completely arbitrary. Okay, However we choose to define our system, the laws of thermodynamics will always apply. So we can define our system to be however we want it to be. And that's good because oftentimes, you know, you define your system a certain way, it makes it more convenient or easier to perform whatever calculation you need to perform. So, you know, however we define the system doesn't matter. The laws of thermodynamics will always apply. So looking at the example of the motorcycle here, we could define our system as being just the engine. Or we could define our system as being the entire motorcycle. It doesn't matter how we define it. The laws of thermodynamics will always apply. Now, the energy balance is going to be different. Let's take a look at that. I mean, the different forms of energy that we put into our calculations depend only on what crosses the system boundary. So how we define the system boundary is going to determine what energy forms come into our energy balance calculations. So if we look at, say, just the engine block, if we're comparing the engine with the motorcycle of systems, let's look at just the engine block. What forms of energy are crossing a system boundary? Well, we've got fuel, that's chemical energy, coming into the engine. We've got exhaust, again, chemical and heat energy that's leaving the system. And then we've got mechanical energy coming out through the piston in the engine, transfers mechanical energy uh, through your transmission system that actually moves the propels the bike forward, so those are the energy forms that we see there. But if we move over to defining the system as the entire bike, now notice that the energy balance is different. We've got 
friction coming into the system. Okay, friction generating heat. So heat energy is coming into the system, crossing those boundaries. And we've got exhaust that's leaving out the tailpipe of the bike. So that's heat energy and chemical energy that's leaving the bike. So you can see here that depending on how you define your system, the energy balance is going to be different. But in both cases, the laws of thermodynamics are going to apply. Let's start taking a look now at each of the laws individually. We'll start with the unofficial zeroth law. And it's called the zeroth law because it's, it's really intuitive. I mean, if you think about it, this is the way it happens, okay? The zeroth law says that any systems in equilibrium with each other must have the same temperature. This just makes sense if you think about it, okay? Oftentimes, the law will be stated like this. If two independent systems are each in thermal equilibrium with a third system, then the two systems are also in thermal equilibrium. So you've got two systems that are independent of each other, but they each have the same temperature as a third system, then those two independent systems must have the same temperature. So it's saying that, you know, if you have the same temperature, you're in thermal equilibrium. Well, that, that's intuitive because that's the definition of thermal equilibrium. And this is why some people don't consider this to be a law of thermodynamics because it's just intuitive if you just think about it. Either way you look at it, nature likes balance. So wherever there's an imbalance in the system, nature's always going to move to restore the balance. So if you've got systems that are in contact with each other and they're not having the same temperature, then nature's going to move toward thermal equilibrium. It's going to move so everything has the same temperature. The first law of thermodynamics says the total amount of energy for any system is always conserved. This is another manifestation of the conservation of energy principle. And we see this with any type of thermal system that we have. So the law can be stated in different ways, there's different ways of looking at this. So some people look at it as the net energy crossing system boundaries equals the change in energy within the system. Or some people say the amount of energy added to a system must equal the increase in internal energy within the system plus the external work done by the system. But any way you look at it, you're really talking about the same thing, which is conservation of energy. So you've got energy in, you've got energy out, and you've got a change of the energy within the system. So the difference between what goes in and what comes out has to be the same thing as the change of energy with the system, since the total amount of energy is always conserved. It's always, it's always going to be the same. So here we've got a system defined here on the screen with the yellow dashed line. That means that everything outside the system is our surroundings. So applying the first law to the system, we have to look at the energy that's going in. So that's, that's your energy in. Then we look at the system that's coming, the energy that's coming out of the system. That's our energy coming out. And then there's going to be a change of energy within the system itself. And these three quantities uh, have to balance out according to the mathematical relationship you see there at the bottom. So the difference between what's coming in and out has to be the same as the, diff the change of energy that happened within the system because the total amount of energy is always conserved. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says the natural direction of heat flow is from reservoirs of higher temperature to reservoirs of lower temperature. In other words, heat travels naturally from hot to cold. Or if you want to use some of that fancy thermodynamics vocabulary I talked about earlier, you would say heat travels from source to sink. But it's saying the same thing. Heat naturally travels from hot to cold, which is a concept that we've seen before. There are, of course, other ways to state this, and most of the other ways to state this involve a concept called entropy. For example, the natural path of a thermodynamic process from one equilibrium state to another will increase entropy in the system and surroundings. Another way to say it would be the entropy of an isolated system will increase over time, approaching a maximum value at equilibrium. But any way you look at it, you're looking at the same thing. Heat travels naturally from hot to cold. So over time, everything in the universe naturally tends toward decay. It tends to become more disordered and random. And that's where this concept of entropy comes from, because... 
whenever you transform energy from one form to another, that transformation is going to involve work. And this simply means that, the, that in the process of harnessing energy to do work, energy tends to change into less useful forms for doing the same work. So some of the energy gets transformed into the work that we want to do, but a large portion of the energy is transformed into a portion that's not available for doing the work that we that we need to get done. And it's because of that unavailability of the energy in the transformation, it energy is said to quote unquote decay. So this amount of decay is what we call entropy. And because it represents quote unquote decay, oftentimes people when describing entropy will talk about the amount of randomness or disorder in a system because you're, that, that's what decay is. Decay is the process of something becoming more disordered. Something that was ordered and put together is now breaking apart. It's decaying. It's rotting. It's, it's, it's going to pot. It's, de it's becoming more separated. It's actually becoming more disordered, more random. Now, most of this you know, randomness or disorder that's introduced to a system in the form of entropy that's really happening a lot at the microscopic level. So it's hard for some people to understand, you know, what entropy is because a lot of it we're talking about, you know, at the sub-microscopic level where quantum mechanics plays in. So some of the concepts here are, you know, kind of really abstract, but if you just think about entropy as being the amount of randomness or disorder in a system, then you'll be all right. And the amount of entropy is always going to increase as nature takes its appropriate path. So the natural path that energy takes is it's trying to restore balance to an equilibrium state. That path, traveling that path, is going to increase the amount of disorder in this in in the in, well, not just the system, but the universe, the total amount of entropy is going to actually increase. Mathematically, we represent entropy with a capital letter S. Now, I talked about available entropy when I was talking about entropy, so let's, let's tell you, delve in a little bit more with this concept. So, when you have energy, all energy has two components to it. There's an, there's an available portion and an unavailable portion. Available energy is the portion that can be harnessed to do work that we need done. Unavailable energy is what's left over. Okay, You can't harness that energy to do the same amount of work. Now, when you're taking energy and you're harnessing it for work, the unavailable portion is usually coming out of some transformation. Okay, and this different form can't do the same work for which the available energy was harnessed. So, for example, an engine, you know, it runs, it produces energy in the form of mechanical work, which is what we want done. We're trying to move a piston. We're trying to, you know, tr do work on some other system. Uh, but there's also other forms of energy that can't be used to do the same work. So, uh, a lot of mechanical systems have heat losses. So, with an engine, let's say you get mechanical work coming out with the piston. That's the work that we want to get done, but there's also heat that's generated. And the heat that's generated, you can't use the heat to move the piston. You can't use the heat to, you know, you know, drive your drivetrain. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Okay. So that energy is still there, but it's unavailable energy because you can't harness it to do the same work as the mechanical energy that you got out of the system. And because there's an available and unavailable portion, okay, we want to know how much of the energy that we get out of a system can we actually harness to do the work that we want to do. And this leads us to the concept of efficiency. Now, efficiency is a characteristic of heat engines. And a heat engine is simply any device that transforms heat into mechanical work. Your author of your textbook goes into this uh, little definite the side note that I, I, well, I think it's a side note. He talks about adiabatic processes. That's one of those vocabulary words I was telling you about there in thermodynamics. Adiabatic simply means heat doesn't cross a system boundary. That's all adiabatic is. So an adiabatic process means 
there's no heat coming out or, or into that system. Okay, so that's where that comes from. But you don't need to know anything about adiabatic anything in order to understand the concept of heat engine. And that's what I want you to focus on. The heat engine is simply any device to transform heat into mechanical work. Now the efficiency of that heat engine is, is a, basically the most energy that you can get out of the energy for what you put into it. So it's basically representing how much bang can we get for our buck. And we usually represent it as a percent with the lowercase Greek letter nu. So nu looks like a letter N with one of the legs elongated there. That's actually a Greek letter. It's a Greek letter nu, and that's what we're going to be using to represent efficiency because that's what everyone else uses. So there are many ways to look at efficiency, but it's the same basic concept. Okay, And here we go right here with the concept. So here we see efficiency, the thermal efficiency, is simply the useful energy divided by the total energy. Now there's different ways to express that. We can look at it in terms of work. So the work done is coming out of the system minus the work that put into the system divided by the heat energy coming into the system. Or we could say it's the heat energy that's coming into the system minus the heat energy coming out of the system divided by the heat energy going into the system. There's different ways to calculate efficiency, but they should all give you the same number because this is what efficiency is. Now, the actual thermal efficiency of a heat engine represents the actual efficiency of the heat engine as it works in the real world. Okay, And that thermal efficiency is usually well below the maximum efficiency that the actual system or heat engine could have. So, this idea of maximum efficiency is also called the ideal efficiency because ideally we'd love to have the maximum bang for our buck. It's also known as the Carnot efficiency because it was the French engineer Sadi Carnot who first proposed this maximum efficiency calculation in 1824. Carnot was a soldier in Napoleon's army. He was a brilliant engineer, but there were a lot of people who were you know, above him that, uh, you know, as is with, you know, big bureaucratic organizations, you know, sometimes good ideas get squashed because the uh, higher ups see it as a political threat. And that's what some of the people saw in Carnot, you know, they, they wanted to keep him quiet. Well, eventually his ideas made their way to Napoleon. But by the time they got to Napoleon, it was too late. I mean, they already had uh, the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington had already squashed him and he was, you know, uh, exiled in the island of Elba off the coast of Italy. So, you know, by that time he got to see Carnot's ideas. I mean, Napoleon is reported to have said that if only he had known about Carnot sooner, he might have come out differently with that war with Wellington. And, you know, it, th 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 that would have totally changed events in the world. So, you know, who knows what might have been. Anywho, Carnot, really uh, famous and... Uh, really smart guy. Anywho, is Carnot efficiency, the ideal efficiency, the maximum efficiency, whatever you want to call it, it's the most bang for your buck. It's the most efficiency you can get from a heat engine. And this is how we calculate it. We take the high temperature, we subtract out the low temperature, and we divide by the high temperature. Now keep in mind that in order for this uh, equation to work, the temperatures you use must be in Kelvin. You have to use the Kelvin scale in order for this to work out. So if you're given temperatures in degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit, you first have to convert the temperature from whatever scale you're given over to Kelvin. Then once you have your temperatures in Kelvin, then you can use this equation to calculate your ideal efficiency. And that's the really important point that you need to remember about this equation is that you have to use Kelvins when you're calculating ideal efficiency. Why is it that we can't ever achieve 100% efficiency? I mean, what is it that's stopping us from being, you know, getting all the bang we can get for our buck? And that's because of the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, remember second law of thermodynamics, there's this thing called entropy. Okay, only some of the energy we have is available to do useful work. 
that means there's an unavailable portion. And this unavailable portion represents energy losses. So the losses actually lower the actual thermal efficiency that you experience from a working heat engine. But the energy losses that you occur are primarily during energy conversion. So the more times you're converting between different energy forms in your system, the more energy you're going to lose and the less efficient your system's going to be. Now, especially when you're looking at mechanical systems or chemical systems, a major form of energy loss is in radiant energies, in the form of heat. Now let's take a look at some of the uh, energy losses by looking at a toaster. So efficiency often occur, uh, losses in efficiency often occur during energy conversions. So what does this mean for a simple device like a toaster? Well, let's consider the toaster as our system, and then let's answer some questions. First, what energy forms enter and exit the system? What energy conversions occur inside the system? What energy losses does the system experience? And what is the ideal efficiency of your system if the interior reaches 310 degrees Fahrenheit and room temperature is 77 degrees Fahrenheit? So go ahead and stop the video here and take a crack at answering these questions. And then when you're ready, come on back and we'll see how well you did with it. All right, let's check a look and see how well you did with this activity. So we're looking at a toaster. We've taken the toaster as our system. So the first thing we do when we're looking at any sort of thermodynamic uh, consideration is we want to define our system. So we defined our system as the toaster, and that means that everything outside the toaster is in the surroundings. The next thing we want to do is we want to label the energy forms that cross over our system boundaries. Remember, if the energy form does not cross a system boundary, we don't want to conclude it in our consideration. So what forms of energy are crossing the system boundary here? The system is our toaster. So what's coming into the toaster is electrical energy. It comes in through the cord. So we've got electrical energy coming in. And then coming out of the system, we've got thermal energy in the form of heat. And we've got light energy that's coming out. So these are the forms of energy that are crossing our system boundary. Now that we know what's coming in and out, okay, it's obvious what's going on here. Okay, electricity, electrical energy is being converted into heat and light. Now that we've done that, that system analysis, now we're going to look for energy losses. So in this respect, it's often helpful to consider the forms that are leaving the system and compare that to what's happening inside the system. So we've got thermal energy or heat that's leaving the system. Well, where does that come from? Where's that being generated in the system? Well, it comes from those glowing nichrome wires that you see inside the toaster. Some of the heat that's coming off of those wires is using to make your toast or, you know, your bagel or your muffin or whatever it is you got there inside your toaster. But all of the heat that's being generated by those nichrome wires is not going to toast your toast. A large portion of that heat is not even getting to the toast. It's just going straight up and out. And these are heat losses. This is unavailable energy. It's not energy that's there to do the work that we want to get done. It's going somewhere else. So we've got losses in the form of heat. And we can say the same thing about the light. You know, the light energy that's coming out. It's not, I mean, the light has nothing to do with toasting the toast. And so it's just, it's just completely unavailable energy that's not there for us to use to do the work we want to do. So we've got energy losses here in the form of heat and light. And there's more energy being lost that's unavailable for work than that's actually available to do the work. And we can see that when we calculate the ideal efficiency. Remember what I said about using the equation for ideal efficiency. You have to have your temperature in kelvins. So the first thing we need to do is convert from degrees Fahrenheit into kelvin. Once we do that, then it's an easy matter of finding out what the ideal efficiency is 
Just take the high temperature, which is 428 Kelvin, subtract out the lower temperature, which is 298 Kelvin, and then you divide that by the high temperature, 428, and you get about 30% efficiency. Now, some of you might be looking at that and saying, wow, that's awfully low. That's the most bang we can get for our buck, 30%? And the answer is, yeah. In fact, that's typical level of ideal efficiency you see for most things. Most ideal efficiencies are in that 30 to 40 percentile range. And it's really rare to see something, say, in the 50 to 60 percent range. And if you see anything above 60 percent, I would, you know, take a look and say, hey, what's going on here? Because you know, from the laws of thermodynamics, it just doesn't jive. So, you know, a lot of these, you know, free energy schemes that are out there, you know, they say we get all this free energy, perpetual motion devices, all that sort of stuff. They violate the laws of thermodynamics, which is why we don't have any of them. <laughs> they don't work. And so uh, the reason why they don't work is because they violate the laws of thermodynamics. So anytime you see something that's got really high efficiency rating, doesn't even have to be over 100%, okay? It could be something like, say, 70%. Well, you know, okay, that's, that's something that most real-world applications aren't going to see. I'd be scratching my head saying, what's going on here? How are you getting this? Uh, because that's just, the sort of thing is just not seen, okay? So this is basically how it goes, and uh, so hopefully this, this helped you out with that. Now that we've taken a look at all but the third law, let's go ahead and, and do that. Let's take a look at the third law of thermodynamics. As a system approaches absolute zero, all processes cease, and the entropy of the system approaches a minimum value. You remember that the way I worded it was, it's impossible to reach absolute zero. That's another way of saying what's being said here. Uh, let me explain how that is. Absolute zero is the lowest temperature you could possibly have. So we know from previous chapters that the temperature is simply the average kinetic energy of the molecules within that substance, okay? So the third law states that, you know, when the temperature, the system approaches absolute zero, so the temperature is approaching the lowest point that it could possibly go. Note that it says approaches. We don't have to reach the lowest temperature. We just have to approach it, okay? All processes cease. So the molecules are going to quit vibrating and jostling in place. In addition, the entropy of the system will approach a minimum value. And that should make sense, right? Because if the entropy is the measure of disorder in the system, well, as things quit vibrating, as they quit jostling in place, and they become more still, they become more ordered. And so the amount of disorder in the system will reach a minimum value. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says that heat always flows from hot to cold, okay? So this is why you can't actually get to absolute zero, because if you're at the coldest point that you could possibly be at, well, how do you prevent nature from restoring the balance? Because you're not going to be in thermal equilibrium with anything. You, you're not going to be at the, I mean, the coldest temperature you could possibly be at. That's the lowest you can go. You're not going to be in equilibrium with anything. So then heat's going to want to travel from hot to cold. And the cold that it wants to go to, the sink that it wants to go to, is where you are at absolute zero. So, you know, the closer you get to absolute zero, the more nature's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're coming more out of balance. We want to bring back the balance. We want to get to thermal equilibrium, have everything be the same temperature. The closer you get to absolute zero, the further away you get from being in thermal equilibrium with anything, and therefore the more impetus nature has to hold you back and pull you back to try to restore the balance, to try to reach thermal equilibrium. And remember, nature is something, you, you can't stop nature. You can slow nature down. We do that with insulation in our buildings, our homes. Okay, so when it's cold in the winter, the heat that our heaters generate, it stays in, but it doesn't actually, we have to keep turning the heater on every so often because, guess what? That heat doesn't stay in the house. It leaves. 
we slow the rate of departure with insulation, but we can't stop the we can't stop it from leaving. It's the same thing when you're trying to reach absolute zero. You can't stop heat from coming in to try to restore balance and try to reach thermal equilibrium with the surroundings. So, you know, this is why you can't ever reach absolute zero temperature because the other laws of thermodynamics are stepping in to prevent you from doing that. So this is why I say the, the real way to look at the, uh, that's what I should say, the simplest way to look at the third law of thermodynamics is to say it's impossible to reach absolute zero temperature. Mathematically, here's how we represent each of the laws of thermodynamics. So for the zeroth law and the first law, that's pretty straightforward, and I expect you to be able to, to understand those. The second and the third law, in order to really describe what those laws are saying, we have to use calculus. So obviously, you're not going to be expected to know any of that, but I would expect you to know conceptually what all the thermodynamic laws represent and that's why I say if you go back to earlier in the lecture where I list out, this is how I would, you know, state the different laws of thermodynamics. Because those are really simple and they encapsulate the concepts that you really need to understand for our little journey here into thermodynamics. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you found it helpful. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video.